In April of 1940, Adolf Hitler launched the invasions of Denmark and Norway. Both countries would eventually fall under German occupation within the following two months. The defending forces achieving little in the way of success, other than one unlikely victory, at a place named Drobak Sound. Following the outbreak of World War II, a number of European nations, including Norway, sought to avoid being dragged into the conflict. Unfortunately for the Scandinavian power, it would soon become apparent they had little chance of remaining neutral. The British government began to apply immense pressure for Norwegian merchant ships to assist with supplying the UK during the fight, risking German reprisal. A military pact with Finland, in their resistance to the invading Russian army, also placed Norway at loggerheads with German foreign policy, as Hitler had publicly allied himself with Joseph Stalin. The final nail in the coffin for the Norwegians would come in the February of 1940, when a Royal Navy warship boarded a German vessel named the Altmark in Norwegian territorial waters. During the course of this operation, almost 300 Allied prisoners of war taken during prior naval battles were liberated from the decks of the Altmark. But in the process, the attacking British sailors also killed seven of their German counterparts, the Norwegians failing to intervene in the act. With the Kriegsmarine having already been applying pressure upon Hitler to secure Norwegian ports with which to combat the British Navy, the dictator took little further persuasion. Formulating a plan, which would involve all three of his armed forces taking control of key locations and facilities within the country, using speed and surprise. An operation conducted in strict secrecy, using overwhelming military force, the weighty Norwegians could not hope to withstand. Key to the success of these plans was the creation of a sizeable naval task force, which would be used to seize the city of Oslo. Sailing along the Oslo fjord under cover of darkness, these ships would arrive in the city and offload a significant evasion force directly into the heart of the Norwegian capital. At the head of this small fleet would be the Blücher, one of the Kriegsmarine's newest warships. Completed only the year before, the 18,000-ton Hipper-class cruiser possessed four double eight-inch turrets, as well as numerous other smaller guns. As well as the Blücher, the fleet would also possess two more cruisers, the Emden and the Lutzow, as well as a flotilla of smaller support craft. In addition to their regular crews, these vessels would also be carrying a small army of 2,000 military personnel, including elite military units, as well as SS and Gestapo agents, given orders to apprehend high-profile political targets, which would allow the Germans to form a new puppet government with which they would persuade the rest of Norway to surrender unconditionally. With the Norwegian navy woefully equipped to engage such a fleet and their country fully unprepared for war, Hitler was confident there was little chance of this plan failing. At approximately 11pm on the evening of 8th of April 1940, the German task force entered the Oslo fjord and began to make its way towards the Norwegian capital. A short time later it was challenged by a Norwegian patrol craft, which was promptly sunk by one of the fleet's torpedo boats, but not before transmitting a distress signal. This signal sent the Norwegian authorities into chaos with the provenance of the approaching ships involved not fully made clear. As a result, forces that had hastily been conscripted in the preceding weeks were mobilised to man coastal batteries along the fjord, given orders to challenge any approaching ships using a warning shot in an effort to try and identify the approaching force. During the following hours, shore batteries at Raoi and Berlin sighted the approaching fleet and opened fire only for the mystery ships to pass by, unimpeded. Cruising through the cover of darkness, the Blue Schooner escorts soon found themselves approaching the Drobak Narrows, situated only 30 kilometres from Oslo, their only remaining opposition of note being an ageing coastal fortress that straddled the approach to the city. Confident of victory, the German ships pressed on, eager to enter Oslo and take control of the city for their nation. 
in its assessment of the possible dangers posed by the Oscarsburg Fortress, German military intelligence had deemed the fort to have limited capabilities. First constructed back in 1814, it had never seen active service and was believed to be used purely as a training facility for naval cadets. In certain regards, and with the status of the fort and its garrison at the time of the incident, this was not an entirely unfair assessment. The overwhelming majority of the 450 soldiers stationed there were young conscripts, with less than a month of military service. The remote minefield that had been requested to be laid by the authorities remained undeployed, as the cadets had not yet been trained how to arm the devices. In addition to this, the fort's commanding officer, Berger Eriksson, did not have a serving battery commander, as the man was away on sick leave. On learning of the approaching fleet, Ericsson decided he would concentrate his recruits on two of the fort's 11-inch guns, rather than spreading them across all three. He also gave orders for his predecessor, who had retired 13 years prior, to be summoned to the fort to act as his executive officer. But for all the weaknesses inherent in the Oscarsburg fortress, as the German fleet approached, there was one vital piece of information they were unaware of. In addition to the fort's gun emplacements, Three torpedo tubes had been built into the side of the building, where the country's main torpedo training facility was housed. It was this lack of knowledge that would prove fatal to the wider German plan to invade Norway. At 4.21am on the morning of 9th of April, sentries at the fort caught sight of an approaching column of ships in their searchlights. Having learned that the invading ships had refused to stop for the first sets of batteries and had sunk a patrol ship, Colonel Ericsson did not hesitate in ordering his gunners to open fire, but the men were nervous, asking if he was prepared for the consequences in the event that this was all just a misunderstanding. Replying that he was well aware that the likely outcome would either be a military decoration or a court-martial, the colonel repeated his orders. As the blue ship passed within 2,000 yards of the silent fort, it seemed to the sailors aboard her as if the path to Oslo now lay fully undefended. Only for the fort's guns, which had never before been fired in anger, and had ironically been supplied by the German government to the Norwegians 40 years before, opened fire. The two 11-inch rounds both hit home, the first shattering the cruiser's mast, and the second detonating in one of her magazines. In an instant, the flagship's electricity supply had been knocked out, and a severe fire spread out all along her decks. At the same time, the shore batteries on the opposite side of the Narrows also opened up, pounding away at the passing warship. As their shell shattered the Blucher's steering gear and her hangar area, the Germans found they could not bring their main guns to bear due to the electrical failure. Instead, using their anti-aircraft guns, they returned desperate fire at the fort and the shore batteries, their ship drifting onwards further along the fjord. The Norwegians hearing shouting and yelling aboard the vessel in German finally learning the identity of their attackers in the process. As the blue ship limped on past the fort, its captain searched frantically for somewhere to beach his ship and offload the 800 soldiers who were waiting anxiously below deck. It was at this point the hidden torpedo battery at the side of the fort opened fire, sending two of its weapons directly into the blue ship's hull. Already violently ablaze, the ship's bulkheads buckled under the twin explosions and her engines now went silent with their only available option being to drop anchor and try and stop the fire from spreading further. The ship's crew spent the next hour fighting to save their vessel, as the Norwegians continued to engage the rest of their fleet. Staring in disbelief as its fellow cruiser was consumed by flame, the Lutzow signalled a retreat and began to turn, sustaining three hits from the Norwegians in the process, leading the German fleet back down the fjord in search of a landing point for their remaining passengers. An hour later, as dawn broke and the Norwegian defenders watched on, the inferno raging aboard the Blucher finally claimed the remaining magazines. With a huge explosion, the bows of the cruiser dipped and then she rolled over onto her port side, before slowly slipping down under the water. Almost immediately, the oil leaking from the sinking vessel had then ignited, claiming the lives of many sailors who had just jumped off into the water. 800 German servicemen had been killed and a further 550 of the survivors were now detained by the Norwegian army. But realising that more German forces were becoming, the Norwegians quickly tended to the wounded and then withdrew to the fort. 
During the following 24 hours, the fort and the shore batteries at Drobak were subjected to repeated Luftwaffe aerial assault. These caused no casualties, but did succeed in knocking out the anti-aircraft guns, persuading Colonel Ericsson to offer his surrender. At the same time, German land forces which had now united in the aftermath of the sinking pressed on and opposed into Oslo, easily capturing the city, but finding in the process that this delay, which the Oskarburg fortress had caused them, had cost them dearly. With the country's king and royal family, and the majority of the government having successfully evaded capture at the hands of the SS. In the process, taking the country's precious gold reserves with them, which was subsequently transported to Great Britain, where an exile government was formed. The unexpected and one-sided loss of the Blucher would be a worry important not only for the Kriegsmarine, but also for Adolf Hitler himself, who would only be able to watch on as during the early years of the war, all of his newest battleships were either sunk or cornered, forcing him to rely solely on his U-boat fleet, a desperate gamble to win the war at sea, which would ultimately fail.